the uh, again today we're fortunate to have Carl Benedict here with us. He uh, has a bachelor's degree from uh, UC Berkeley. Master's and PhD work was done here. He has a significant expertise in a whole array of different disciplines that are relevant to us in the library here. One is he's been in private industry and consulting for six years. He's uh, most recently and currently runs the Earth Data Analysis Center here on campus through uh, geography. Uh, his background, though, is in archaeology and anthropology, so he covers a whole lot of bases there. And he's just uh, finished up a stint where he was uh, president of the Earth Science Innovation Partnership, which is uh, a very large uh, non-government organization, but it's supported by NASA and a number of other federal agencies. Uh, it's about, uh, I think, 150 different institutions, uh, research agencies nationwide that belong to this, and uh, Carl has uh, led that effort for the last year. He's got a very uh, lengthy publication record, and he's been uh, the recipient of grants from NASA, and NSF, a whole array of different agencies done a lot of work in the state, so he knows uh, uh, pretty much everybody in Santa Fe through the uh, annual <laughs> trek up there to testify to the legislature and so on. It's a small so, city. <laughs> uh, again, uh, a great pleasure to have Carl with us. And uh, today he'll be talking about the academic library research data services in a world of data intensive research. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, and, and given the uh, action-packed day that we have, I feel a little bit like uh, one of the, uh, and benefiting from being one of the early acts in one of those weekend-long music festivals where everyone's pretty much exhausted at the end, but I get you while you're fresh and hopefully mostly awake. I see some coffee cups out there, so that's a good sign. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so I'm going to be uh, talking for a little bit here about um, especially the research data services and how the university libraries, academic libraries, are um, really a uh, very logical and productive location for supporting the, uh, the data intensive research that is increasingly the focus of um, our faculty and students here uh, within the universities. So uh, I'd like to start with um, a little bit of a story about uh, something that I worked on long ago. And this is uh, back in 1987, um, about 285,000 acres burned as a part of a wildland fire in the Stanislaw National Forest in the Central Sierras. Um, and I came on to a project as an archeologist with 14 others to do a survey of that, that area to try to locate any of the archeological sites that would potentially be damaged through the attempt to salvage the timber associated with this large fire. You know, as a matter of scale, if you were to drive from here to Gallup, you could envision a three mile swath all the way from here to there as the area that was impacted by this fire. And as a part of this project, we surveyed nearly 40,000 acres of that burned area looking for archeological sites. Um, and I learned a number of important lessons uh, from that project that you know, come forward and, and provide some themes for my discussion today. First, we, are, um, we're, we worked in a team environment where there was essentially a rotating leadership model where we learned from each other and we essentially had a community of workers that were collaborating on the individual projects that we're working on. And that turned out to be a very productive and effective model. We encountered data management challenges that were of a scale that had never been encountered, particularly in this uh, environment in the US Forest Service in the late 80s, where we had literally hundreds of archeological sites that were being documented, and we were needing to do that work very quickly and efficiently. It was, and so there was a significant scale challenge in terms of the management of those data. And we were starting to experiment with new technologies and strategies, even at one point, God forbid, forget uh, for, uh, contemplating using geographic information systems to record information about the various archaeological assets, whether the historic or prehistoric resources that were in the area. Um, and these were all factors that contributed to and carry through my experience that I brought into both my academic work and my ongoing professional work. 
So and with this is sort of a setting the stage for where I've come from in thinking about uh, strategies for supporting research data services within, within the university, we can move on to this concept of data intensive research. And this is um, a quote from one of the papers in the fourth paradigm, a publication out of uh, Microsoft Research that was focusing on the diverse uh, activities related to data intensive research. And I want to focus on some key concepts here as we are continuously confronted with these issues of the trustworthiness of the scientific conclusions that we're reaching and this increasing need to have collaborative research, working in research teams where we need to exchange data and information effectively with each other. We need, need to be able to work together while still maintaining that core value of reproducibility of science. And so we're now dealing with what is described here as an aggregate record if we're talking about reproducibility, where that aggregate includes the traditional publications that come out of the research enterprise, but it also includes the necessary data that are behind those conclusions that are fully required to actually allow others to try to reproduce the results that are obtained as a part of these data intensive research projects. This is where effective research data management comes into the scene because without effective management of data through the research process and then beyond into the, the phase where the publications are out there and the data are needed to uh, provide uh, supporting evidence for those publications, that's, a, that's an emerging role that, that uh, research libraries, academic libraries have been uh, providing. As a couple of illustrations, of some, some uh, emerging areas of, of uh, data intensive research. This is an illustration uh, from a paper in Science that was published last November of a research group that was examining changes in uh, forests globally. So they actually worked with over 500,000 ind individual remote sensing images and mapped from year to year the change in, in forest cover at a 30 meter resolution. So, you know, basically a little bit larger than the size of this room over the entire planet, whether or not forest was increasing or decreasing and doing this repeatedly over a 12 year period of time. That alone would absolutely qualify as a data intensive research project. But they've gone one step further. They've actually, through their partnership with Google in this case, and the Google Earth Engine platform, which they use for doing the analysis, they are publishing all of the underlying data and the data products that underlie this research project through this web interface. So if you're interested in reproducing or examining or working with the products that came out of this research project, you can go to this site, which they actually, uh, they finally were able to release it about two weeks ago. Um, and, uh, and so you can go in and actually download and access the data that underlie this, this significant data intensive research program. As a longer term indication of these trends in data intensive science, you know, in an area that is uh, much closer to my experience, is the trend in the use of geographic information systems as a part of the research process. And this is just related to archaeology and geography. Just a very, very simple uh, search for those terms, GIS or geographic information systems in the titles or keywords for publications, key journals coming out of the archaeological community, particularly with a focus on North America. Um, and then also the annals of the Association of American Geographers. Um, just primarily here to illustrate this upward trend in the use of geographic information systems as an index for the amount of geographic data that are being used in these analyses and that are being generated with one key question being, where are those data now? Um, how can we access those data? Are those data at all documented? Um, if they are documented, how so? Using what standards, if any? Um, some key benchmarks in this timeline would be here in the late or in the, in the mid 90s, the development of the Federal Geographic Data Committee standard for geospatial metadata. Um, so that's when we had the emergence of one of the early standards for documenting geospatial data. And then here in the early 2000s, 
the emergence of the ISO, the International Standards Organization standard for geospatial metadata. So while many of these data products that are coming out of the GIS systems may have associated metadata using those standards, my experience at least in working with uh, researchers that are producing geospatial data is that that's not likely. Um, which is one of the areas where again, our expertise in the library community for documenting data and information and facilitating access and, and discovery of those data is really key. So this as a backdrop, backdrop for data intensive science can then lead us into a discussion of the, the respective life cycles or processes that we may find ourselves in in terms of the data curation process, here the, the data life cycle, but also having to think very carefully about how we integrate that with the research life cycle that the researchers that we're working with are most familiar with and are more accustomed to thinking about in terms of the work that they're doing. So this is where, if I can start things up, we can start with a very quick view of the research life cycle and those of you that saw my presentation several months ago, will, this will look familiar to you as I'm not going to belabor this other than just pointing out that the research life cycle has a number of these steps that are going to be very familiar to our researchers that we're working with as, as they will be with this research process. If we then integrate that with a data curation life cycle um, where this is a process that we would typically be going through in terms of archiving and documenting and providing long-term access to research data products, um, we can uh, start to envision the linkages between these two life cycles because we really need to have a model for translating from the conceptual space of the researchers here on the left into the both conceptual and operational space that we're working within as, as essentially data, data curators, as, as data archivists. Um, and as I've think to, thought about this before, I've, I've actually done some mapping of these little ovals onto that, but I started thinking about a more effective way to uh, display this and conceptualize it and really operationalize um, this mapping between these two life cycle spaces. And this is what I've come up with which in a moment, the musicians in the audience may confuse this with an impossible chord to produce, um, but this is basically displaying what I've, at least my first cut, at trying to identify the points of interaction between this research life cycle here on the left, representing those two uh, circles linked to each other, um, and the data life cycle on the top, where you can see the loop represented by the arrow here and then returning back here and then a couple of other loops that capture some other activities as a part of the data life cycle. I'm going to revisit this diagram a number of times, but one of the key things that I want to point out here is that a mapping like this does allow us to, whoops, go back, back. <laughs> Um, it allows us to um, start to focus on those particular areas and activities where we can most productively uh, work to support the specific work that's being done by our researchers. Again, as they're likely to be thinking of the work they're doing in this context and being able to think about their context as it maps to our activities. So stepping back just a moment, we can start to think about the role of the academic libraries in terms of research data services, because this is not brand, brand new, but it is an emerging um, activity in academic libraries. And in particular, some of the uh, uh, emphasis here, and this is coming out of a 2003 publication out of ARL, um, highlights some of the areas that point in the direction of the logical role that libraries can play in supporting research data services. In particular, we already have within the library a, a, this traditional cultural emphasis on the curation of knowledge. And research data fits very nicely into the collection of knowledge that we should be thinking about as a part of our curation role and that preservation and access role. 
Um, we see already a large number of publishers and specific research domains sort of stepping in to provide uh, services and infrastructure to uh, provide uh, for some sort of access to research data. But this is an important point that is made here where specific research domains or publishers may not have the long-term interest or the interest in the long-term preservation of those data objects. And the, the academic libraries, that is a part of their mandate. You know, once we bring materials into our libraries, they enter a long-term process of management and ongoing assessment and evaluation. Um, it's what we do. Um, it's not necessarily what the, either the science domains or the publishers um, do in the long run. It depends on, in the case of the publishers, their ongoing business model. In the case of the research, the science domains, different access methods to those data products. And this is where potentially partnerships or collaborations between academic libraries and the publishers and the science domains can be very useful, where we may have more complementarity as opposed to, an, you know, if this or that sort of choice. Um, so as we're looking at this increasing shift towards both data sharing and using, the, and using those shared data to accelerate uh, discovery and research, you know, there's, there's this, they say, may recognize libraries as facilitators for research data. I think that recognition is already here. Um, it's a matter of being able to back up that recognition with you know, the necessary institutional uh, support as is needed and also the in, and, and institutional support doesn't come just in the form of funds. It comes also institutionally in terms of the, or, the, the academic community within which we operate and actually having the researchers and their students that we're working with recognizing the role that the library can and should play in supporting their research data activities just as the library already supports their other research activities. So as we think about the uh, existing activities in the, in the rest of sort of the, the research library community, these are also, this is also based on statistics out of that, that same ARL uh, survey that was released last summer and you can see the bottom of it is <laughs> cut off, but the important part is here where out of the respondents to that survey, anywhere from 61 to 89 percent of the respondents to the survey were already providing some form of data management planning support. This is in response to the, um, basically the funding agency requirements that researchers provide a written data management plan that is sufficiently specific to convince them that, they're, that the data products that they're going to generate are actually going to live through the research process and then survive to actually then become available and discoverable to other researchers in the future. So ensuring that the investment that is made in the creation of those data objects will live on as opposed to dying with the end of that one year, two year, five year, ten year project. Um, so data management planning is certainly a part of it, but it's not the only part. Um, if we look at this middle number of 74 percent, that was the number of libraries that are already providing some form of data archive support. So, um, and that's why this, you have this arrow going pretty much all the way through the entire data life cycle because they sort of uh, bunched it all together in terms of the variety of activities here in the entire data life cycle within that 74%. But that's not a small percentage. That's a, that's a large number of libraries that are already doing that type of work in some form or another. And then when we get out here into the far right hand side, um, there's also a very large number of libraries that are already providing access um, for use and reuse of their data products. And even, um, 50, even half are now starting to either plan or have uh, developed transformation services. So those are analytic tools, data visualization, data mining sort of capabilities. So it's not even just a matter of providing access to those static data objects that may be going into an institutional repository or a data archive, but it's actually having services on top of those data that allow you to interact with them in ways beyond just being able to discover and download them. 
Um, GIS, it turns out, was actually one of the leaders in terms of one of the, the analytic services that was supported by many libraries, as geospatial data in particular um, were identified very early as a particular class of data objects that were needing uh, special care, let's say. And so th that's a set of uh, support activities that have been even much more broadly supported within the research library community. So how do we get there? How do we start to envision the process of moving towards um, a, a broad scale and effective research data services within the, an academic library? This is where this, this concept of positive deviance um, comes in, and I can thank Ted Haberman, who's now at the HDF group, for introducing me to this concept, um, which is one that is particularly effective and appropriate for an academic environment like the university, because it's one that is uh, essentially community-based. Um, and given the dynamics of interaction between a university and working with individual researchers and their students, we really have to approach this as the development of a community of practice with whom we are participating and, and getting information, receiving knowledge as guidance to the specific activities that we take on, but it's as much or more a development of this, this community understanding of the value of and the practice of effective research data management and the transition of those data into long-term uh, discovery and access. And so this is um, a quote that is actually included in one of the papers that is, again, cut off at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, <laughs> but um, this, this very much encapsulates this, this process of developing a community and getting the community talking about how they do what they do, identifying what, what, are, what are called positive deviants in that community, those folks that are actually being successful at doing the things that you want to do and figuring out what is making them successful. What behaviors are they, are they exhibiting? What technologies are they, are they using? What strategies are they using? And figuring out ways to highlight those members of the community that are actually do, already doing what you would like the rest of the community to start doing and building from those positive deviants and so instead of sort of dictating or defining your goals from the top down, you actually build them essentially from the bottom up using these positive deviants as exemplars within the community that you build out from. So when you think about uh, essentially a leadership model based on this positive deviance approach, you have this distinction between sort of this traditional approach for managing change, because that's really what we're talking about here. How do we, how do we um, you know, nudge our system forward from uh, one where we have um, largely a collection of individual researchers and research groups managing their own data independently, investing in their own resources, doing so with uneven success, some with great success, some with less great success. <laughs> um, and the ongoing challenge of transitioning those data into a long-term system for, so that they can be um, discovered and accessed and curated uh, for future research. Um, we can, and I'm not gonna read through these, but you can see that the common theme as you look through these is this role of the community. Identifying the community, allowing the community to essentially move the process forward and looking at those positive deviants, those folks in the community that are already doing what you want or what your goal is and being able to learn from them and being able to highlight their success as a way to influence the rest of the community that you're interacting with. And this is especially important when we think about the institution that we're in here because we do not have a lever. We do, you know, all we can do is, you know, we're, otherwise you're pushing a string uphill. You know, <laughs> you, we cannot do it. All, all we can do is illustrate the success of others in a way that allow people to see themselves in that success, see the methods and strategies used by those other successful members of the community, and then be able to identify which of those strategies or methods they may be able to use in their own research. As a complement to that, as 
we are ex adopting our role for research data management with the institution, we, we then look at what infrastructure or support or capabilities we need to provide to essentially lower the barrier to entry for those folks that are wanting to do the right thing, that are wanting to more effectively manage their data, more effectively share their data, more effectively collaborate in their research. So it is a very different model for one, from one that we are traditionally uh, inclined towards of you know, documenting those best practices and, you know, and shoving them out there and saying, you, you should do this, um, you should do that. Um, the adoption model for that is not that great as you know, they talk about um, the uh, transplant rejection uh, strategy as you know, if, if you're perceived as sort of foisting strategies or, or technologies on from outside of the community, the likelihood of adoption of those technologies or strategies is significantly lower than if those are developed through the community and the interaction of the members of that community. Um, so there's the, you know, there's the not invented here sort of problem. Um, this is an approach, since it is focused on the interactions of the community itself, that helps to uh, reduce that. So the overall message here, as we focus on the role of academic libraries in research data management within the institution, is first, our multidisciplinary focus. You know, we already have a mandate to be interacting with the campus as a whole, with all of the diverse research domains that we have here on campus. We're already perceived as a neutral ground within the university. We aren't necessarily seen as a competitor in the research domain that our various um, departments and research groups are operating in. We're all, we already have uh, that reputation as being the resource that folks come to, uh, to when they're looking for um, support in the research that they're doing. We already have expertise in the principles of, of curation and archival management. You know, that, that focus has traditionally been in our physical collections, emerging towards and including now our digital reference materials, our online materials, but that same knowledge, philosophy, and, and, and understanding can fairly easily be transferred into strategies for the management of research data. Finally, we already are a part of the network of interaction within the university through our various subject specialists and the staff that are, that are working at our desks, the faculty and students that we're working with through our co various courses and instruction sessions, we are already at the hub of the campus network in terms of this, this what we would hope would be an emerging community of practice around research data management. So as we think about the logical position of academic libraries within research data management, we can then revisit this concept of some of the specific roles and activities that we can participate in and contribute to as they relate to the data life cycle and the research life cycle. So I've already talked about the network that we're involved in, which is key. We already have um, a good understanding of essentially um, the identification of best practices, whether it's in data management or curation of materials. Um, now, as I was just saying, you know, presenting things as best practices may not actually be the best approach, but they can't, it, understanding what some of those best practices are can help us in our interactions with the community of practice and also in identifying those folks that are, that are employing those best practices and sort of coming in through those uh, productive deviants, those positive deviants to spread the, the benefits of those use of those best practices across the community. We already have experience in essentially the strategic planning that move us towards those long-term goals of improving the research support that we're providing to the institution. I might, as an aside here, I was really happy when I discovered, when I looked at this, that the underlying map here is actually that same area that burnt in 1987. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and finally, we already have existing 
knowledge of technologies and already starting to develop technologies that are well aligned for supporting this full data life cycle as it's integrated with the research life cycle. So as we then move forward, we can start to think about these four activities or roles as they then translate back into this, this uh, interaction diagram that I presented earlier. So when we think about, go. <laughs> there we go. Um, first, the network. Here I'm not talking about our physical network. I'm talking about the network of interaction we participate in. You can see all of the elements that at least in this first cut of trying to link these activities um, where that network, that interaction with our community um, can have an impact. Whether it's in the conceptualization on the data lifecycle side, which for our research partners consists of the production of ideas, the identification of partners, and the development of proposals. Moving all the way through to all these other activities, and of course, I'm not going to you know, go through these button by button, but you can start to see a pattern in how the network that we're engaged in and the community that we're working on encouraging the development of fit into various locations in this interaction diagram. We can then start thinking about infrastructure. That, that more computer support, technology support side of things, which you know, on my legend drops off the bottom here. But you're starting to see now the accumulation of points in this interaction diagram where you might, to see, might start to see increased return on investment in development of those areas, or also areas where we have critical um, bottlenecks, where you know, if we're wanting to support our researchers in the development of proposals, we need to make sure that we are able to uh, basically facilitate these various points along this interaction diagram. Instruction and training. This is something where you know, we already have a group of, let's, uh, let's you know, continue to use this term, positive deviance in our, in, our, in our university that are already doing things well. But we have a much larger population of folks that if they wanted to adopt better data management pra practices or participate in the transition of their data products into long-term access and curation, they need some, some form of instruction and training. And these are the various locations that I've identified where that instruction and training can play a particular, uh, in particularly important role. And finally, we have curation, you know, that, that intellectual process of ongoing assessment of either data assets as they're being considered for entry into the system, assessment of those data assets once they're in the system, or that reassessment once they're, once they're in, the, in the data management system for those that might, for one reason or another, warrant removal, whether they are replicated in other other archives where they are essentially redundant within ours, in situations where um, better or, um, or, or more representative data are available. There are any number of criteria that might be developed uh, as a part of this curation process. But you can see these are the areas where that intellectual process of curation of those data assets comes, comes into play. Bottom line is we now see sort of these four uh, roles lining out and starting to identify some common sort of hot spots in the interaction diagram, whereas we're developing our strategies for more effectively supporting research data management, we can think about where are our investments in infrastructure going to give us the largest return. Even with those investments in infrastructure, what other things do we need to do besides the, you know, the buckets to store the bits in? What other things do we need to do to actually close the loop on really supporting the development of proposals or supporting the analysis of data? Being able to make sure that we don't you know, have an 80% solution, that for the lack of that remaining 20%, we aren't able to actually bring folks across the, across the moat into the nirvana of effective data research data management. So in terms of actions that, that um, are likely to uh, produce some beneficial benefit uh, results, 
you know, we're really trying to answer this question in terms of what we can do to integrate effective research data management into our existing services. Because this is not something that we want to bolt on as, you know, like Frankenstein's head onto another body. This is something that we really want to embed within our existing operational model so that the interactions with our researchers are as smooth as possible. So that it is really a part of the full service model for the interactions between the researchers and the, the scholarly support services that we provide. So first thing, we need to um, you know, essentially identify a core of users and capabilities. And this is you know, starting to build out that community and identify those positive deviants. And I just have three examples here of folks that I've had a chance to work with in some of my time here at UNM. Whether it's uh, you know, Stephen Brown, who was a master's student in civil engineering, who was <laughs> specifically focusing in his thesis on advanced technologies for managing and sharing hydrologic data and information. His entire research project was essentially how you can improve the research process by using these more effective data management methods. We have Laura Crossy over in Earth and Planetary Sciences who with her research group and, and the research group in uh, civil engineering is adopting a platform that is actually a standard used by the US Geological Survey for doing quality control QA, QC and processing of raw field observations whether they relate to water quality or stream flow, being able to have a standard platform for generating those products and even potentially being able to share those products. Uh, providing opportunities to vastly improve the process for bringing the out, outputs of those processes into long-term discovery and access. Or we have uh, Fred Gibbs and his work in the history department in terms of digital humanities and his group of graduate students that I had a chance to do a GIS instruction session for a few months ago with his encouragement as he was trying to get his, his students thinking about uh, new and novel approaches for managing the data and conceptualizing the problems that they're working in in terms of being able to work with larger or more complex data sets that have a geospatial component. So these are just examples of the many candidates that we have out there that we can potentially use to highlight some of these um, emerging um, effective data management strategies within the university. So we need to continue to uh, identify this core of exemplars and folks from whom we can all learn and, and build out from that core. We need to uh, build our integrated data management infrastructure. So we need to be able to have an infrastructure that is able to meet our researchers where they work. And because the, the last you know, thing that we're going to be able to accomplish is basically pushing our researchers to adopt tools that they aren't currently using. We may be able to slowly move them towards adopting more effective data management, but you're going you're gonna to pull Microsoft Excel out of the cold, dead fingers of many of our research teams on this campus. So if instead we're able to develop infrastructure that is more um, able to effectively work with or be used in conjunction with the tools that they're already using, we're going to be in a much better position to actually be able to realistically support this full data life cycle as it's integrated with their research activities. This places a focus on a high level of interoperability, the ability of the systems that we're developing to support the research enterprise, being able to connect to other systems to effectively sh share both the data and metadata and do or documentation. So the infrastructure that we're envisioning, which we already have a great start on, in terms of uh, capabilities that are already under development here in the library, being able to continue to envision this, the evolution of this infrastructure as it needs to link to the tools and technologies that are being used by our researchers and their students. Um, the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that they're already using tools like Dropbox and Google Drive and other things like that. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not typically going to streamline the processes that we, we may envision for being able to transition their active research products and projects into long-term curation. So we need to think about how we are 
I, I hate to use the word competing, but we at least need to have solutions that we can present to our researchers and their students that are providing a viable alternative to uh, technologies that are already working for them. We need to uh, expand our instruction strategy, continuing to develop our formal instruction, our credit-based courses, but also um, continuing to grow our uh, more informal instruction, whether it's through uh, single course sessions, whether it's targeted workshops on particular technologies, ideally led and driven by those positive deviants that we've already identified in our community. Um, and then also curating other materials and being able to bring them in so that we can have a, a vast array of information resources that we can bring to bear on a particular data management problem with the ultimate goal of being able to funnel those solutions into the system that's going to most effectively provide that, uh, that efficient data curation and access and preservation. Finally, we need to work on developing a set of data collection guidelines, just as we are now in the process of, of revising our other collection guidelines, so that we can embed in those guidelines the, the, essentially the valuation of and evaluation of data that are going to enter the system, the criteria that those data should meet for integration into the, into the data management system, models for ongoing assessment of those data products that are, as they're stored in the system, and then you know, strategies for being able to move those data forward so that they continue to be available through time as we move through perpetuity. Because again, our goal is long-term access, which again distinguishes what we're doing from what may be the, goal, the goals of the publishers or the particular scientific domain folks that are also uh, creating data repositories or data, data archives. So in conclusion, this is sort of a, a set of activities that we really need to be focusing on as we are, are envisioning the growth of this long-standing uh, research data support capacity within the library. We first need to recognize that we have a set of core competencies and values. We need to build on those. And that's one of the reasons why academic libraries are actually seen as the logical focus for research data management because of those competencies and values. So we'd absolutely want to build on those. Um, we certainly need to expand our technical capacity um, where our researchers may uh, look at that capacity in terms of the capacity of the buckets that they want to put their bits into. But we need to actually have behind the scenes the capacity that more effectively provides for the movement of those bits through a data life cycle with associated documentation and other information. We need to continue to expand and evolve our instruction. As a part of the feedback that we're getting from the community and learning from the community, we need to continually assess what our, what our instruction strategies are. Um, we need to, as I was saying earlier, integrate the work we're doing here into the routine operations of the library in terms of our, our support for the scholarly uh, activities within the university. So it's not an extra add-on, it's just a part of the, the full package of uh, services that we provide. And finally, and as I say here most importantly, we need to develop the program in conjunction with the community of practice within the broader institution. Because if we don't approach it in that way, in terms of being a part of the community, as opposed to driving that community, the likelihood of success is going to be much lower. Um, and so with that, I just have a, a couple of acknowledgments here. Again, I want to thank Ted for, uh, for introducing me to this concept of positive deviance, which I think, again, maps particularly well into the academic environment within which we operate. And with that, I'm ready for any questions. Mm -hmm. using it for change management, right. and you've given some generalities with a few specifics, but you actually have experience here at UNM. So on your first day on the job, you're going to do something. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you seek out those deviants. <laughs> um, 
Well, that is actually, I think, one of the most important uh, first steps is to um, start to get the word out to the community of practice for the folks that we know or, or, or suspect are doing uh, first data intensive research because that's where we're going to have the largest impact. Um, and being able to start that kernel of that community of practice um, around the folks that are doing that work and within that group then identifying those positive deviants that we can then hold up as our exemplars and learn most effectively from as we start, and, but that's an ongoing process of continuing to grow that community of practice so that eventually we can envision um, other, let's say, uh, moderately data intensive researchers who would also benefit from more effective data management practices, starting to see um, through the, the uh, word that we're able to spread. So there's, there's, there's a, also a communication strategy that needs to be developed as a part of this um, to spread the word more broadly through, you know, whether it's, you know, public lectures, through workshops, through, you know, any number of venues to continue to reinforce this, the spread of this concept of, of an active activity that may be coordinated out of the library that, but has the broader uh, participation of the campus community as a whole. I think that would be one of the things to do on day one is to start building that community because if we don't have that, the rest of it is not going to be very, very successful. Well, yeah, that, that, is, that is a key point, and that's where the learning process from those positive deviants that you're absolutely right are likely to be the ones that have actually built out their own infrastructure and developed their own models. Being able to learn from essentially the strategies and approaches that they have used and to take what we learn from them and embed that in our planning for the implementation of the infrastructure that is a part of what we also need to develop to lower that barrier so that there is an alternative to Dropbox that, oh, by the way, in, in our system, is as easy for, easy for them to use as Dropbox, but it also can feed into the rest of our data lifecycle process. So we can have interfaces that can facilitate the documentation of the data that they're putting in the system. Um, but we have to first understand essentially where the community is and then have as illustrations sort of the capabilities the, and the functional requirements that those successful positive deviants have developed and then look at what we need to do to provide that infrastructure for the rest of the, the, the mass of researchers within the university that don't have the wherewithal, technical or otherwise, to be able to do it for themselves um, and being able to essentially build the bridge across the chasm through the infrastructure and training and other resources that we can develop and provide to them. Um, the specific libraries I don't have at the top of my brain as I've been actually diving more recently into, say, the survey results that came out of the ARL process. But, there, but the libraries that, say, we visited as a part of our data service expansion team uh, project last summer, um, the primary focus has actually been um, largely in the support for the research data storage and the transition of those data into sort of a long-term data archive while in the, in the survey responses was, uh, was uh, fairly high. In many respects, that remains sort of the, the put, placement of data into institutional repositories that aren't necessarily ideally designed for uh, data archives. 
So this full picture, this comprehensive picture that I'm presenting here um, is not implemented to my knowledge in, in any one place, but parts and pieces of it are implemented in a variety of libraries as indicated in those survey responses. Right. Um, I have given that a lot of thought, <laughs> and you know there are there are uh, the the easy answer to that is that you know with enough money we can hire a lot of expertise and we can uh, build a lot of infrastructure. But that's um, neither realistic nor I would actually argue consistent with this idea of engaging the larger community of practice within the institution, um, because you know. Standing up, you know, 10 petabytes of storage as a bucket for researchers to toss data in um, would be both an expensive proposition and not one that necessarily would um, move us towards our goal. Um, in terms of the resources that we need, um, the first thing we need to do is essentially identify the existing resources we have on campus in terms of expertise. Um, expertise in the tools and technologies, um, expertise in strategies for handling uh, large and diverse collections of data so that we can um, both, again, you know, in, in the way I've been talking about this, learn from those folks, but also start to identify those as potential resources. So looking at the existing resources that we have and developing strategies to effectively use those resources um, uh, uh, as we can. As a part of that, then we need to identify where the gaps are. Um, and it's when we identify those gaps, and some of those are absolutely going to be uh, technical in terms of the computer and data management infrastructure that we have. Um, in just about every conversation I have with researchers when it comes to data management, the first thing they ask for is storage. Um, and in reality, um, when we're talking about effective management of data so that it's, it's assured that it's actually going to survive through the research process to then be available to move into the rest of the data life cycle, having effective storage systems that are not sitting in a single computer under somebody's desk right next to a pile of dust bunnies, um, that's a very effective strategy for making sure that that first mile is well paved. Um, but you know, the, the, again, the, the resources in terms of the te technical uh, work that we need to do is integration of these different tools to streamline um, the, the flow of data, either as experienced by the researchers or within our processes in managing the data archive. That's going to take probably some additional human resources in terms of software integration expertise in addition to the computer resources required to, to do that. Um, and then there's that data scientist uh, concept that I talked about uh, uh, now several months ago in terms of uh, the expertise uh, that is typically across multiple domains, including some computer science, some statistics and mathematics, and some domain expertise. Um, we may have some of those within the community that we're developing, but we may very well find ourselves needing to uh, uh, identify and fill a couple of key positions within the library to provide uh, broad data science services um, as a part of the sort of menu of options that we provide. So those are some of the key areas where we're likely to need both human and technical investments. Yes. Oh. All right. You talked about the a community of practice. Right. Well, in many respects, in my sort of informal uh, <laughs> definition or conceptualization of both a, a learning community and a community of practice, um, I, would, I would use them fairly interchangeably in that that community of practice, at least in the way that um, I've conceptualized it here, is a community that is uh, in a continuous learning mode from the other members of the community. So it's an ongoing um, learning process 
in terms of the interaction and exchange between and within that community and even with external communities. So in terms of um, a learning community or community of practice, um, in that way I would, I would potentially not differentiate very strongly between them. Um, on the community of practice side, there is that other um, action component of it where um, you know, uh, that may slightly, slightly differentiate in terms of these are practitioners of research data uh, management, uh, data intensive research. And so it's, it goes beyond sort of the exchange of ideas within the community, but this is the ongoing evolution of practice within the community um, as it's informed by the individuals doing their own work, doing their day jobs. Um, and so that could be one area where that, pr that, that term practice um, does play an important role in terms of uh, possibly the distinction between a learning community and the community of practice. Thank you.